On the other side of the globe lives a place where everything is first class, from the world's only seven-star hotel to an indoor ski resort, a land of conservative Muslims, wealthy tourists, and exotic locales. And for one night, the racing world turns its attention to the world's most prestigious and richest event. So let your imagination run wild. This is Dubai World Cup. You're in the middle of the Middle East, but you feel like uh, you feel like it's its own place. Dubai World Cup race day is right up there with the best of them. It's uh, it brings the rest of the world together in the Middle East, which if you said about 10, 15 years ago that that's what would happen in the world of horse racing, people would have laughed at you. It has been described in the past as an Olympics of horse racing, and if there is such a thing, this is probably it, because they do come from the four corners of the globe to race for the big money at Nat Al Sheba. To put on a production like this, it takes a lot of sort of manpower, passion from people who really enjoy horse racing, putting on a huge event, um, and that's what we've got here. Uh, for 21 million plus U.S. money, seven races, it's probably the most international horses competing on one stage. You come here and this is, this is the best of the best and you know, it's, not just, it's not just a few good horses in, in a big race, it's, it's the best in the world. You know, there's, there's, there's all the good parts of American racing and all the, the great parts of European racing. I mean, it's unbelievable where, you know, where the horses are coming from and they're coming for one thing, to be competitive and to win the money. Uh, the, the atmosphere as evening bells on and then right before the World Cup they have like an official opening ceremony and, uh, and that in itself it's like watching Cirque du Soleil, it's just a fantastic experience, the crowd really gets into it, all the locals, yeah, it's just like something out of, a, out of a fantasy movie actually, so get tied on. Almost 8,500 miles away from the city of Los Angeles, California, on the other side of the world is the rapidly evolving city of Dubai with an approximate population of 1.5 million and roughly twice the size of the state of Rhode Island, Dubai sits on the Persian Gulf, right in the heart of the Middle East. And it has truly become the epicenter of international horse racing through Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum's brainchild at the Dubai World Cup. Champions such as the Great Cigar, Silver Charm, and Dubai Millennium have taken center stage on Dubai World Cup night a spectacle which began back in 1996, giving the world its first $4 million horse race and has since grown to a $21 million night of the world's best racing, making it the richest horse racing event in the world. And thanks to the good people at the Dubai Racing Club, HRTV was able to witness it all firsthand. We're on leg one of this uh, Dubai trip and right now it is just about 10 minutes to eight out here on the west coast. And it's going to take about one day from now to show up in Dubai. We're still in downtown LA on the way to the airport, so I guess you got to start somewhere and we're starting in a taxi cab. We have the map here and the only thing I can find is the racetrack. Right through those doors, we're walking on a plane for the next 20 hours and we're going to be on the other side of the world. I don't know, my heart's racing. I don't even know what time of day it should be. I've really lost track of all sense of time. We just, we just flew business class. Looks more like first class to me, but let's go check out Emirates definition of first class. I thought we were flying, uh, I thought we were in first class back there, but this is apparently the real first class. So if you want a drink, no need to call the stewardess. Just push this button and voila. And in the same way I travel to Dubai in Emirates luxury, so do the World Cup competitors. And I don't mean the jockeys. The horses get to Dubai on Emirates in their own personal stall, which resembles a massive shipping crate. 
And if I need a passport, so do they. Well, this is the Nat Al Sheba jockey's room. When I arrived at Nat Al Sheba, I was given the opportunity to tour the jockey's quarters. A familiar set of colors. They are the Godolphin colors. Another visual that left a lasting impression on me when I thought about the greats in modern racing that had passed through here. But it is just one portion of this incredible place that is not Al Sheba. It's a facility that has changed in the space of three weeks. Anybody who comes racing at Nat Al Sheba for a Dubai International Racing Carnival meeting will certainly enjoy it. They'll see some good racing. They'll see Nat Al Sheba in one form. They come back three weeks later on Dubai World Cup night and Nat Al Sheba has been transformed, as you've seen yourself, at the International Village, the marquees, the gallery. It's a different race track. The course remains the same, but the track is different. And then you get that magnetism of people from all over the world coming, flooding around the outside of the parade ring, looking at the horses coming from all around the world. There's a buzz, there's an excitement that really adds to it. This racetrack, the, it's not an oval, it's more of a triangular shape. It's massive. You can't hardly see the other side of the uh, backstretch. There's a golf course in the middle, and one of the most impressive things really to me was you stand right on the finish line and you look all the way down the chute where they run the Golden Shaheen, the six furlong sprint stake race, and it's so far away, three quarters of a mile. It's so different in America where we're used to the horses coming around the turn out of the chute going six furlongs, and you don't realize how far it is until you see it in the straightaway form and you just stand on the, on the finish line and look all the way down there and it's pretty cool. There's very few horses that can be all out going three eighths of a mile. So you want to be in a good position, give the horses a chance, but you do, do need to come in here, focus and understand on the layout. You don't realize when we watch these races on TV that the grandstand is basically on the turn and the finish line is right at the turn. So as soon as these horses hit the finish line, they're immediately pulling up into the uh, first turn. No hands. No hands whatsoever. He steers himself. Just behind me is the Burj Dubai, currently the world's tallest structure. And upon completion, it will be the world's tallest building. And they are saying that they will average a new floor every three days. But aside from the modern skyscrapers and sprawling resorts, there's a portion of Dubai which embraces its past, a marketplace, the souks. All right, we're right outside of the gold souk and the, and the textile souk, and our taxi cab driver actually told us that all of these boats right here are what bring all the product into these souks, and they, they come over from Iran. All of these boats, they just go all the way down the canal. Here's the entrance to the uh, Dubai city of gold. Just rows and rows and rows and rows of different jewelry. Watches, Rolexes. I'm not even sure I would know where to begin if I was looking for something. Really? Watches, oh no thank you. What's the bag? No thank you. Just about anything you want. You don't even have to add. They just come up to you. Definitely has an interesting taste. It's not too bad. What in the world am I doing putting ski boots on in the deserts of Dubai? Oh yeah, there's a ski hill. It's rock and roll. We're going inside, it's negative four degrees centigrade. If I would have paid attention in chemistry class, I could probably convert it to Fahrenheit. Nonetheless, it's cold. Another unbelievable sight in the city of Dubai. Who would have thought that you could have skiing in the middle of the desert Maybe for this. Oh my god. Oh my lord. Oh. I I'm not 
Outside of the Dubai World Cup, no question the hottest ticket in town is the Arabian Nights Party. A one-hour bus ride outside of the city in a 6,000-person stadium in the middle of the desert was the Arabian Nights Party. A night for everyone to unwind one last time before World Cup night. Arabian Nights gave everyone the opportunity to sit back and once again receive the first-class treatment Dubai offers and enjoy a performance and fireworks display second only to that that we would witness on World Cup night. Whatsoever. He steers himself. Whoa now. These things don't buck, do they? Whoa! He's angry. <laughs> The beauty of Nad Al Sheba startles all who come here, especially in the mornings when the thoroughbred, the most majestic of all animals, takes to the track. His first trip to Dubai, my first trip to Dubai. Better talk now and me. We got something in common. I think anyone that's experienced it for the first time to see 45, 50,000 people come to a racing facility where there's no wagering, they came for the love of the animal and the enjoyment of the day and the night. Uh, this is by far the world's most international and global meeting. It's, it now, uh, every year, can guarantee drawing together the very best turf horses and the very best dirt horses in the world. It's something that the rest of us really have to aspire to. It's, a, it's why it's a great place to showcase your horse because there's no great advantage. It's the middle of the world and horses come from everywhere. It's a, it's a good neutral place to take on the world. Easily the best part of the entire Dubai trip was the culmination of the week. Dubai World Cup night. And to make it even better, if that was even possible, the international broadcast asked HRTV to be America's voice on the world's richest night of racing. Well, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, I was going to get some help with the American horses from our American expert, Scott Hazelton from HRTV. Scott, it's your first time out in Dubai. How are you enjoying it? It's amazing. It's something that I, I couldn't prepare myself for. This gave me an opportunity to rub elbows with all of the major players on race night. Every direction I turned, there was a racing great. Dettori, Gomez, Dukak, Andre Fab, Ryan Moore, and even Sheikh Mohammed and Princess Haya. My perspective for the racing was incredible. But before race night, I had to sit in several production meetings in order to get ready for the broadcast. And the biggest thing for me was getting to understand the differences between international racing and the racing I'm so used to in the United States. Even our racing slang was different. From terms like punter meaning a better to a stayer meaning a route horse. And the most foreign thing to me was the pre-race routine the horses had to go through. So, so while we're in here getting ready for say the... There's an area labeled the pre-paddock, which is essentially a cross between the receiving barn and paddock. Horses come over well in advance of their race and go to their assigned stalls in the pre-paddock. The saddling also takes place in these stalls all of which is outside of the public view. But as soon as the gate sprung for the first race, it was lights, camera, action. Ready to run. Eights are back, racing in the Godolphin Mile and Black Cat, Black Kitten and Don Renato to the inside, both slow to go. America's Barcolo came out quickly. Strikes after being headed, hits the lead again. 50 meters left to go. Diamond That's Edgar Prado. Edgar Prado's winning. And Diamond Stripes wins. Diamond
Diamond Stripes first, Elusive Warning second. Now his first ride in Adel Shiba, he gets a win. Edgar Prado, such a great guy. All he went through with Barbro and everything, it's so cool to see him win a race like this in his first try. The atmosphere is unbelievable. The kind of the whole colour of the of the night is so fantastic. The kind of combination of the wonderful Arab gentlemen in their fantastic white outfits and their headdresses, next to the best of European dress and the best of American style, it, it brings everything together. It's a cosmopolitan melting pot. This is the International Village, which is the place to be. We are being told this is our first walk in here. What does it take to get ready for something like this? Half an hour. Half an hour. Half an hour, yeah, for all of this. Where are you from, sir? South Africa. South Africa. You remind me a bit of the mask. Jim Carrey of Biscuits. We're in Dubai, in the International Village, but they have a Dunkin' Donuts. Ladies, how are we doing tonight? We are very happy to be here. Where are you from? Germany. Is this your first time in Dubai? No, it's the third time. How are you ladies doing? We're great. Is this your first time at the World Cup? It is, yes. What do you think of it so far? Fantastic. <laughs> Where are you ladies from? Australia. There seems to be a lot of Australians out here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Are you rooting for uh, Nick and Nero? That's the only Aussie horse here. Really? Yeah, okay, yeah, we are. There are certain things we are told that we should experience in life. For those who live in the world of horse racing, one of them is World Cup night at Nad Al Shiva. And the 2008 UAE Derby belongs to Honor Devil. Benny the Bull goes yeah. up to Idiot Proof. Yeah. Benny the Bull takes the lead. And Benny the Bull beat Idiot Proof. Star Crown is third. And as far as the World Cup ceremony is concerned, there are really no words that can do it justice. Delay is literated three quarters to Lord Admiral. But just JPEG and Dargina, JPEG the outside, JPEG, JPEG foot back to beat Dargina. 250 meters to go from Yung Zane, the pride of Hong Kong, Dr. Nino on the outside, South Classics in front, still more than a length. Viva Batakas trying, the poster's looming up, it's South Classic, it's another one for South Africa. We said it was going to be spectacular and we haven't disappointed you. What a wonderful, fantastic Dubai World Cup. As soon as Dubai World Cup comes closer, you see all these big international horses and, and you realise that you, you are not boxing in the same category. All week the attention was on America's super horse. Steve Asmussen, Curlin, the big horse. And I was allowed to be basically right next to him in the pre-paddock and be a part of the calm before the World Cup storm that Curlin was about to unleash. You can see his size, his musculature. He's the Arnold Schwarzenegger of, of horses. <laughs> and, and yet he has, has this huge stamina and desire and speed uh, and, and durability and distance. So that's why we fell in love with him when we first saw him. Putting this all into perspective, what is it like to be the headline of the entire week here at Dubai World Cup? Well, it's an outstanding feeling, but Curlin is deserved of that and off his previous races, and hopefully this is uh, uh, another one of the major goals that we have in mind for him. Curlin goes in and premium tap, last year's runner-up, will be the last to come along. And they look ready. Racing in the Dubai World Cup. 550 metres away and Robbie Alvarado asks Curlin to go. He moves up on the outside of Asiatic Boy, well armed on the rail, but Curlin takes the lead. Once they hit the long Nad Al Shiva stretch, it took very little for Curlin to just draw off on his international competitors and there was no doubt who ruled the racing world that night. Curly. And Asiatic boy, they're battling out second and third. Carolyn lead, close to the winning post, and from the red, white, and blue corner, by TKO, the undefeated champ, 
is Curlin. Curlin has beaten Asiatic Boy and Weller. And while everybody celebrated and received their trophies of gold and jewels, Curlin's reward was much simpler. I continue to say unbelievable, but we're standing right now in, in the middle of what will be Maidan, the pinnacle of international racing. As impressive as Nad Al Sheba is, the future of racing in Dubai goes beyond what I think anyone has ever imagined in horse racing. I continue to say unbelievable, but we're standing right now in, in the middle of what will be Maidan, the pinnacle of international racing. The centerpiece of Maidan is without doubt the racetrack, but it goes well beyond horse racing. Maidan is a city and a center of commerce that will come without precedent in the modern world. It's gonna be one kilometer long from, from end to end. It's just incredible. One year ago, none of this was here. And over the course of the next two years, it will become what they have planned for Maidan. It's nonstop the workforce, 4,500 people right now working as we stand here. And they're going to increase that workforce up to 7,500 people. We see it on paper. I can't imagine what it's going to be like in person. I think it's going to be the premier race course in the world, just as for the, the racing industry. But it's a symbol of lifestyle. It has unique features, and I think it's going to be an attraction throughout the year. I think the thing that we wanted to do, first of all, is, is to look at the grandstand and look at the flow of the horses, the flow of the owners, the trainers, the jockeys, the media, the public, the VIPs. I've taken the architects around the world, and we continue to review and change and look to make sure that we've crossed the T's and dot the I's. Approximately 80,000 fans will be able to witness the carnival of racing over the 76 million square feet the track will occupy. Whether it's an unobstructed view from one of the 270 hotel suites or a seat at one of the 10 restaurants, you can even ride up in style in your yacht via the Maidan Canal. Fans will be able to enjoy the visual splendor of Maidan City, shopping, golf, parks, residential developments, and office space will all be encompassed in Maidan City. And this will all be showcased at the 2010 Dubai World Cup, Maidan's World Cup. I believe it's not just going to be for Dubai, it's for the whole world. This is for the horse goers, horse owners, trainers, jockeys, who are associated with this industry, plus the spectators. Plus, I think it's going to be a a landmark, in my opinion, for, for the nation. 